there's some uh, analogy. Do you think there's some uh, analogy to the necessity to draw epistemology and the algebra and dialectic before get it roughly transparently and outlining before roughly? Yeah, that that was what I was trying to suggest to you that that. To the extent that you don't bring fanciful connections to the outline, like, okay, now I've done my job. Now, if the boss called me, I could show him this. I could say, you know, if if it's just that, that's why I read what I read to you was just so that Kierkegaard said I need to do that, the dialectical algebra, a bunch of times, to get comfortable with it. Now. Do remember that he published under the name of Anticlimacus to suggest that he had a certain ambivalence toward form, but but there, don't that thing about that I don't work with an outline. That's a fanciful association with what I'm suggesting about the process of the artist. You know, do whatever you you need to do to get to the fucking work. The pragmatic, you know, William James used to talk about the cash value of an idea, and he didn't mean money. What he meant was what behavior does it produce? Does the idea produce? And if the idea produces getting to work, it's, it's a valuable idea. And if that's an outline, if that's writing in French before you write in English, uh, that's why I was trying to deploy all those different examples for you. What's the title of it? A sickness, the sickness under death. Catchy. Despair is the sickness under death. We done? Yeah, I, I, uh, it evolved. It evolved. I had a method there for, you know, uh, for a while that in, entailed. Uh, shooting heroin exclusively and never writing as a preparation <laughs> for writing. It's, uh, that that method is called the long view. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I mean, if you really want to know, I mean, th because it always seemed to me that, uh, you know, the nightmare logic of network programming is that uh, you give a black guy a position of authority. You don't give him any story, but you make him a boss. And to me, that always seemed like a fanciful way to neutralize the problem of race and storytelling. So I call them Lieutenant Fancy. If you look at any of those fucking shows, you know, they say, it, they used to do the same thing with my Uncle Hutz when he was a bookmaker and he had to fix in and at the end of the month they had to have a quota of collars, you know, to show that they were doing their job. So they'd call him and give him advance notice and they'd say, Hutz, you got to take a pinch, leave a nigger. So everybody else would split and that was the way the black employee got a bonus. I mean, he knew that all that had to have, he got arrested, and they came and bailed him out, and they gave him a $20 bonus. So in some sense, everybody's a nigger. Now I was, uh, here I, I thought I had dug my way out of my political incorrectness, <laughs> and right the fuck back in it. Thanks a lot. So, uh, who's got a show that they want, they want to talk about? Come on, give it up. It'll be so good for you. You want me to start? I was always the kid that took it out first. <laughs> um, so, we're doing a show. I just came from a lunch with... Uh, that I was working out with my brother for and, and his and his son, my nephew Michael, for a long time. 
You know, I told you that I had that one show I'd been working on that series for about 35 years. Uh, my brother was a surgeon. My dad was a surgeon. My dad was in the hospital the first two years of my brother's life. And uh, uh, there's some sense in which my brother, I think, was chasing after my dad his whole fucking life. Uh, he became a surgeon. He was in the, he, he be, when I joined the staff of the same hospital my dad was on, and my dad, because he uh, had, uh, was a little threatened by uh, anything, anyone who he perceived as a rival. Remember we talked about the fact that my dad, when he was a little boy, his mother left and went back to live with her father, and so my dad was kind of sibling rivalry uh, was not restricted to brothers, you know, it was like, uh, anyway, uh, so my dad and my brother were on the same surgical staff at the hospital for, I don't know, 20 years. My dad never watched my brother do one operation. Uh, and, uh, And in his decline, uh, part of what led my dad to take his life was that uh, because no other doctors would come and take care of him because he, was, he would have just attacked them uh, for incompetence and, and, and then uh, secretly uh, after sometimes when he'd been operated on, he'd go in and mutilate and his, he'd reopen his wound. You know. uh, so my brother was the only one to take care of him. And uh, in the confusion and despair of things, uh, to the extent that manliness was associated with professional authority, uh, my dad became very mistrustful of my father, uh, of, my, of my brother. And uh, it took his life in front of my brother and my mother. Um, that's a sad story, isn't it? It's pretty sad. Uh, and I'd ask you to remember at this point, you know, that uh, I recited to you yesterday Mr. Warren's poem about where it is just sort of a jumble of experience. It starts out in, in a dream and he sees this Christmas tree that's 40 years dead and the skeletons of his parents, and and uh, then he follows the lo the poem, and he winds up in Times Square, and then he winds up in in the bitter root out west, and he, and at the end he says, uh, all of the items listed above uh, are part of the original dream that I am trying to discover the logic of. And this is the process by which the pain of the past in its pastness is converted to the future tense of joy. Now, the act of sharing uh, is the process by which painful recollection is converted to joy. Uh, Certainly, uh, all of you, none of whom ever met my father, uh, feel a great pity for him. And however selfish or ugly uh, you find uh, that act, uh, you, those of you who are believers would spare a prayer for him. And, uh, and in my brother's goodness, after my father's death, he retrained himself. He resigned his position as a surgeon and retrained himself as a hospice physician in order to better care for the dying. And uh, that process, too, 
there's a process by which the pain of the past in its pastness is converted to the future tense of joy. Uh, there are people in a lot of other countries, in Eastern Europe, and who uh, the idea of, of, of the hospice position is that medicine finally is not curative. It's pastoral. I will walk with you into whatever darkness awaits us all. And I will try to give you whatever comfort I can as we make that journey together. And when the journey's finished with one person, the physician goes back and takes another hand. There's a wonderful humility in that and, and a kind of joy. And I believe that by that act, my brother has put my dad at rest. And in that sense, my dad made possible in his passing the comfort of many thousands of strangers. That's how the pain of the past is converted, how the future continually reinterprets the meaning of the past. Uh, so that if one stopped the story at the moment of my dad's passing, that story would have a completely different meaning. And it's the business of art to sink its roots deep and to identify how the fanciful interpretation of experience, which would have us understand it as a despairing and isolating experience, if the fanciful associations are removed, becomes the imaginative experience, which is joy. So when my brother was a kid, he used to bring me, uh, there were these landmark books, uh, you know, the things that kids read, you know, Ben Franklin, Young Fucking Lightning Rod, or, you know, like that. And, and Bob would always uh, find stuff about doctors because he needed very much to idealize. Uh, it helped him, you know, the, the same image that I had in the hands putting money through the window is a way that I had of not seeing what was nearby. The idealizing of the image of the doctor was what helped my brother, I suspect, not see the person who wouldn't wait up for him. And... Uh, the series that we're working on is a series set in the, uh, which is about how American medicine was created at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. Uh, and as it happens, the great surgeon who, be, uh, the great American surgeon was a guy named Halstead who was a junkie. And in that combination of the idealized how American medicine was created uh, with the fanciful and the process of storytelling eroding what is fanciful so that Halstead uh, I think it's probably safe to say that Halstead had some issues around uh, gender identity and he's a big orchid, big orchid raiser. And uh, he was married, but he lived on the second floor and the bride lived on the third floor. And the bride was rather an active lesbian. Uh, also his nurse his operating room nurse. Also, the woman who would smuggle 
his heroin into him while he operated. So that when she came down with a dermatitis, because they used to dunk their hands in carbolic acid to disinfect them, Halstead said, I cannot operate under these circumstances. The real problem being he couldn't get his dope. So one of the good years was sick. And the good year, this guy Goodyear wired back to the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Factory, make some fucking rubber gloves for this nurse so I can get my operation. And they did, and she wore them, and Halstead agreed to operate, and that's how they discovered that if you wore rubber gloves, infection diminished. Now, the series of the, the juxtapositions of accident and obsession and woundedness, uh, that's how that explosion which began all of energy and all of life continues to compound and express itself. And our job is to stay with fancy long enough for imagination to show through so that the experience transpa transparently manifests the originating spirit. And uh, let me tell you also that uh, Johns Hopkins was a Quaker uh, whose father had a revelation that slaveholding was a bad thing. This was after the father had made about, in our money, about 20 million bucks off being a slaveholder. Well, better late than never. You know, Johns Hopkins, uh, uh, he didn't own slaves, but he sold dope. He was a big liquor salesman and a tobacco salesman, a very pious man. And on his expiration, he left all of his money f to set up a university, a hospital, and an orphanage for black children. And uh, those institutions, therefore, were properly the expression of impulses spinning against the way they drive. So uh, a lot of Johns Hopkins' fortune, because he was a Baltimore boy, was in the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And uh, the railroad barons were all swindlers and thieves and stock manipulators, you know. And uh, in the bid, there were several financial panics, not dissimilar to the ones we're living through now. Uh, and the only problem with these bonds was they were worthless. Uh, but bonds were only worthless if you admit that they're worthless. If you can get somebody to buy them, then they ain't worthless. Uh, now, the inheritors of a large portion of these bonds were a group of Quaker lesbians. Uh, all the daughters of the Johns Hopkins trustees. Now, in those days, you know, uh, women weren't admitted. There were co-education that wasn't going on, you know particularly at the graduate level. One of these women, uh, Carrie Thomas, uh, her dad was a trustee at Johns Hopkins. She wasn't that pretty. Uh, and when she was a kid, regrettably, uh, she was set on fire. And it took her mother a couple of minutes to get there. So she was horribly scarred and everything, and she, now her mother was uh, quite an accomplished woman. Her sister became one of our great suffragettes, and Carrie Thomas herself uh, founded, for example, Bryn Mawr College. And, uh, but uh, 
she would never let her dad, who was a doctor, change her dressings. She made her mother do it. And it was a kind of punishment for the mother not getting there in time. And also, there were a bunch of other kids, and this way she got her mother's attention. You know, a lot of complicated, mixed motives. And uh, so she became a very... Uh, she became very active in her sexual identity at a time when lesbianism was uh, had a lot of euphemisms uh, attached to it. There was a lesbian relationship was described as a Boston marriage, and uh, the sexual component of it was rarely referred to, even by the principals. You know, people just. Women just lived together, you know, and uh, not Carrie Thomas, but uh, so she was seducing women right and left, all of whom were more attractive than she, and all of whom were also the daughters of the people who ran, uh, who were the who were the trustees of Johns Hopkins, and she worked out a quid pro quo whereby they would provide the bonds that could be used to finish the school, the only problem being the bonds were worthless, uh, in exchange for co-education. And because the trustees also didn't want to admit that the bonds were worthless, they took them. Now here too we get a juxtaposition, you know, when, when you've heard me say history is a lie agreed upon. And certain symbols like bonds, if you can get a collective agreement about them, that's why the stock market goes up, then the stock market goes down. That, that's just variations in the extent to which you can get people to agree upon the worth of a thing from day to day. Um, and that's something which can be extrapolated and explored in a lot of different ways. But um, as I tell you these stories, uh, you can see where that'd be a pretty fucking interesting story to tell, how American medicine got invented, you know, how uh, revolutionary operating procedures came out of people trying to get their dope which has always been a, a prime motivation for me, uh, it, it, that, that there is no such thing as a pure motive or a perfect outline. Uh, history is never tidy. And spare me one more minute to, to realize that this very private experience of my brothers and mine, how in the course of storytelling that would seem to lead inevitably, well, of course that's an interesting story. Of course that, that'd be a good story to tell. But if you just go in and pitch it, I got a great story. Johns Hopkins Medical School, 1893. How did they get the buildings built? Now, that's 13 on the air, right? Everybody's going to back that. Um, and if you're afraid, that's how you're going to pitch it. And, you know, uh, in terms of, it makes me think of it as lesbians, you know, uh, Samuel Goldwyn always had scouts out for new properties. So his scout comes back from Broadway and he says, Mr. Goldwyn, I got one. Great play, great roles, the children's hour. The only trouble, it's about lesbians. Goldwyn says, don't worry, we will make them Mexicans. Uh, which is to say that if you're in fear, if, if, if you're not willing to let the fancy, if you don't trust yourself, to reveal, say, that a story set in a gold camp in 1877 is a contemporary story.
to if if you don't trust that the scenes will gradually erode what is fanciful and seemingly inaccessible about that premise, or if you're in a pitch and you're pitching a story set in ancient Rome and they say, we got one, there's a bar mitzvah ahead of you, can you set it somewhere else? If you trust imagination, you can see the way a story set in 1877 in the Indian Territory is really the same story. You substitute one abstraction for another. Um, that that's when your the spirit has allowed you to rest transparently in itself, and that that's that's uh, you know uh, the chemist Kakuli said visions come to prepared spirits, and uh, whatever habit you need to generate to prepare your spirit to receive the vision whether it's an outline or not an outline you know or right now outdoors or indoors get the vision want the vision don't want to stay in fear done <laughs>